Last week, I spoke on the real facts of our undulating feelings, our, the swirling. Someone in the church said, I feel great. Well, good for you. But, but I, I still want you to address that, 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 that low hum of what we've been through. The last 24 months, have, we've churned up some emotions. Uh, the, 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 the attacks to our moods, the statistics say the, the um, what was it called? The deferred anxiety. When's the other shoe going to drop? No, it's over. No, it's over. No, it's over. You know, there's been a lot of pressure that our souls have had to deal with our health and our well-being. Well, thanks to God for his faithfulness. But in my talk last week, and I'm going to recap a little bit of it, I hit it head on. I said angst disappointment, grief, that's a real thing, loss, whether it's just the loss of, you know, some dreams or, or your peace, it's taken a toll upon us. I compared it to, if you listen closely, you can hear the hum of these speakers just a little bit. Imagine if that were amplified. You'd have to yell a little bit in your house. You'd say, Deb, do you hear what I'm saying? And yeah, I heard you. Why are you yelling? You know, and there's this, this thing. You, coworkers are acting crazy because there's this palpable thing that is what's going on. But that's okay because God is with us. And so we took a moment. We sat in worship, just like I, I felt the worship in here today. That's a time for us to, you know, the Bible says, Love the Lord God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. So there's these parts of us, and we need to understand that we have a mind, we have a body, we have a soul, a body, and a spirit. And these things all work together. And worship helps us deal with our feelings. Feelings are real. Emotions are real. We serve an emotional God. He can be grieved. He loves. He's a passionate God. And, and so, we, all, so we, are, we are made in his image. And so he says, come to me as the wonderful counselor. As the wonderful counselor. I have a friend who's an attorney. Frank is his name. And he says, guy, every time people call me, they're in a bad mood. I'm like, oh, that's a hard job. Most of the time it's hard. So, but here's the thing. God's never in a bad mood. God's in a good mood. And the thing is, is that he's your counselor and you can call upon him. In fact, he's inviting us to do that. Imagine a counselor with unlimited resources. That's our God. And so we made room at the end of the service because I wanted to model what you can do in your own homes. I wanted to model what it means because we're so busy. We're just, we're so busy. I heard of somebody, I don't know who he was, a great man, say, I'm too, he's an older man. He said, I, I, how did he say it? I don't have enough time to hurry. That's what he said. I don't have enough time to hurry. Now you, you all, all, all the gray hairs are nodding their heads. The other guys are like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I want to go full speed ahead at all times. That's what the younger ones are thinking. Pedal to the metal. Well, I heard a race car driver talking like that. He said that's how he won his first races. He just put that thing to the floor and he won a lot of races until he started crashing a lot. Because there has to be a time that we realize unless you finish the race, there's no way of winning it. And so I talked a lot last week about setting some time aside for soul food. And the rest of this talk, I'm gonna talk about that. The lover of our soul, because you gotta deal honestly with yesterday if you're going to move into the gold God has for you in the past. And so I want to give you a license as Christians. In, in, the, in, the, in the denominations that I was raised in, you know, we would just ask David. We would just, my leg's not broken, you know. No, I'm not having any troubles. I'm blessed and highly favored. And you are. But, and you want your spirit to be full, but sometimes your soul is lagging behind. And when I say soul, I mean your mind, your will, and your emotions, but the good thing is that God has given us a mind that can be renewed. He's given us emotions that move us into the future. And I am all, I'm telling you, your spirit needs to lead your soul. It needs to be the engine that leads your train. Well, I feel this way, but God says this. But that distance, that gap, that cognitive dissonance between what the word of God says, right, and how you feel, the way that gap is closed is by being honest with your feelings and then align your thinking with the word of God. And I want you to have, have some grace with yourself as you do that. And so um, I, I don't mean to take you a little deeper here with, a, with, a, 
with the downward spiral, but I'll tell you this. On the threshold <coughs> of a new year, our spiritual nourishment needs to remain front and center. Here's the symbol of soul food. God has stored up for you before you even get there what you need to push you through to the next thing. God's name, one of his names, Jireh, is provider. He is Jehovah Jireh, pro Vide, provider, he saw ahead what you were gonna need. He's already canned the goods for you and they're waiting for you. And so you don't have to hoard. You don't have to live like the world that says, get all you can, can all you get and sit on the can. You don't have to think like that. God is, all, God is an ever flowing fountain, but we need to return to him. Here's what, here's what some of the stats say. We're hearing healthcare workers breaking down under pressure. I saw a video where the, a local hospital respiratory therapist just, I mean, he's, on, he's being interviewed by a woman. So he's on his best behavior and he broke down twice because the pressure, I know one hospital up the road, they've lost 35% of their nurses. Imagine what that does for the other 65% that are just like crushed by this weight. Uh, um, therapists just walking out. A recent joint article uh, uh, between the Fuller Institute and the Barna Research Group on why pastors leave the ministry says this, 1,500 clergy are leaving pastoral ministry each month. Over 4,000 churches closed in America last year according, according to this. So many denominations are reporting an empty pulpit crisis. And under this pressure, pastors are walking out. People are abandoning their faith and their faithfulness. We're trekking through such difficult times right now. I mean, just picture Santa fans, picture snowshoes. You know, well, picture yourself walking without snowshoes. You need some snowshoes. The Bible says, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel. Right? If that isn't good enough for you, go back even further. Job says, I bathe my feet in butter, which is like, Pastor, what does that mean? Well, it makes me think of the milk of the word. If I got a bunch of cream and I, I started doing this pretty soon, what would I have? I'd have butter under my feet, anointing, grease. Grease is the word. So under all this pressure, we have to know that um, second service does something to me. I don't know what it is. It's totally different. It's just totally different, Meg. We're trekking through hard stuff, but more than ever, we need to recognize heaven's healing food. Heaven has healing food that God is serving up for us. That's why I've called this series Soul Food. And so with intention and purpose, I have paralleled God's tender mercies to the benefits and the pleasures of real comfort food. He says, forget not my benefits. Because ultimately, friends, he is the only one that can feed us, right? I mean, come on. We can go for a long stretch where our marriage is rocking, but eventually, wah, we're going to have a couple bad days. Our jobs, we're going to be killing it, but then you lose an account. You have to have, like I said, that music in the background, the Lord himself, to hold you through those times. He will nourish and restore your soul. So I want to ask you, are you feeling depleted? Some of you feeling numb. I don't, I don't know what you're dealing with. Some loss, maybe even a, a bit weary as we go into this year. Well, don't worry. Have no fear because this series here, um, by means of Psalm 23, 23, the Lord has directed us. 23 will be our banner, but we have to remain encouraged by what the psalmist says. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I just, you know, we remember before, above, aboard, bow, what were all those prepositions we had to memorize? This word with is so important. You are with me. It ought to change our prayers it shouldn't be, Lord, help me get out of this. It ought to be, how are we getting out of this, Lord? What are, you, what are we going to do, Jesus? And so Psalm 23 is awesome because this is where he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
You know, I shall not crave to the point of, of angst. I shall not want, uh, the Lord of the shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters for his name's sake. You know, the Lord will restore your soul. This is what he's saying. Your soul matters to God. The soul is almost the picture of the bride of Christ. Soul in Spanish is alma. And you got to get alma married up to spiritu. You see, soul and spirit. So we have this bride waiting for some guidance. Sorry, guys, but you need to marry the Lord too. Soul food is personal nourishment in troubled times. That's why I've named it this. And so um, I'm talking about this. If you want to know, I believe at the end of this talk and at the end of this series, you will know, um, you'll be equipped on how to access the nourishment of God every day. How many times do you eat a day? Two, three times a day, right? Same thing, morning, noon, and night. The Lord has provided for us an empowerment to step into a new level of satisfaction and a new level of joy. And I believe at the end of this talk in this series, you're gonna be able to do that. So trusting the Lord means receiving what he's dishing out of heaven's kitchen. I lived in hell's kitchen, literally, right in midtown Manhattan. It's called hell's kitchen but I also lived in it spiritually for a time in my 20s. You don't want to eat what's coming out of hell. He's always trying to serve something else, but God is serving the best. You know, when you go to dine with a king, you have the best food, the best food, the finest delights. And trusting in the Lord is not just about um, our spirit, man. It's also about our own, look what it says. Look what it says in Proverbs 3. He's talking about your physical body will shine. He says, it, it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Take your calcium and magnesium, but don't forget this nourishment for your bones. You understand, God, Jesus came in the flesh to help your flesh. I was teasing my brother for a service on because I know he streams, and it's like, he and I are always joking because he's a good Baptist, you know, but... I want you to know that Jesus didn't just come for tomorrow in heaven. He came for today to refresh your bones, to rejuvenate your spirit. What does that scripture say? It says, no one's given up house and home and brother and sister, whatever, and not received double in this life and the next. Jesus, we just came through Christmas. Jesus was incarnate. I told you, he became carne flesh so that we could be warmed and fed by him. And so I'm talking about comfort food. I'm talking about soul food um, because they're, they're rich in calories, chock full of carbohydrates. That's what, when you think of it, you think of greens and biscuits and stick to your ribs things. And so God's prepared a feast for us, he says, in the midst of our troubles, in the midst of our enemies. You know, if I wrote that scripture, I would say, he has prepared a feast for you and your enemies, you are, you, they're so gone, you can't see them for miles. It's not what God wrote. So you picture this table set for just you and the king and none of those jokers are invited. I'm sorry, virus, stay over there. You're not invited to the feast. Nasty in-laws, keep your comments to yourselves. You know, whatever your enemy is, you know, God is telling you to love your enemies, especially if they're, but he's saying, you don't have to invite them to the table. They don't deserve, they're not invited to a seat at the table. But I love that he says, even in the midst of the trials, I will be there. In the midst of your sickness, in the midst of your marital strife, in the midst of your money problems, in the midst of your doubt, I'm already there. Look at Psalm 23. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed and refreshed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. This talk today is about how to live. How to live more dependent on the resource that is everything. Dear ones, it's not that we won't face enemies. Come on, we know that. They may surround us on every side, but it's our God, our loving God that has set a table for two. Look what he says in Matthew 11. He promises us this. He says, come to me, come to me. I don't know how you, picture it any way you want. Picture him screaming 
a, not Lord doesn't scream, but picture him shouting, I guess, I don't know, projecting his voice across the Sea of Galilee. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy. Come to me, as far as you are, come to me. Or you could picture him the way June probably does. Come to me, come to me. You, you're not close enough. The Lord is not afraid of intimacy. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Look how we actually, look how this one's phrased. This is the amplified. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Well, I don't work in the fields, pastor. Yeah, but you're working all the time up here. Lay heavy laden and overburdened. I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Mac McCambridge used to say, every morning, you get 24 golden box cars called hours. And, but that train, once it leaves the station, you can't get those back, right? You can't get those back. Now money, that comes and goes. But time, once it's gone, it's gone. That's why time is precious even to God. Who, 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 to God has all the time in the world and beyond. He created it, right? Sorry, time's created, he created it, and, 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 but, but, he's, but he's given it to you, and it's limited for us. And he wants us to sacrifice like we do. That's why we practice tithing and giving. We have to learn that we can give it away, and God will give us more. What does he say? I will redeem the time. When I started spending time alone with the Lord in the morning, he made my days longer. And you can get everything done when you give him first first. And so comfort food I'm talking about, southern soul food, I'm from down there, are dishes that warm you from the inside out. There's this place called Dave's CC Club in around Tallahassee. I'm not going to tell you where. It's a secret. You have to turn at the big oak tree. But I want you to understand, you walk in there on Friday night, and it's like blues is playing, and there's greens cooking. I mean, it, you don't need, there's no menu. It's like, you hungry? Yeah. And you, it's awesome. And I'm trying to tell you that comfort foods, they warm you from the inside out physically, emotionally, right? In the natural. Well, this idea of heavenly food, Jesus said, I have food you know not of. We live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Where can I find such things? Right here. And God will, God's done writing this book, but he's not done speaking. He speaks through this book and he'll speak right through your spirit because He's living with you and in you. The idea of a heavenly soul food has to do with feeding the appetites of our deepest hunger. Yet in the spiritual realm, we eat, right? But we shouldn't eat. You know, how did I write it here? I want to make sure I get it right. We ought to not eat. We ought to eat to live, not live to eat, right? Yeah, pastor, you, you sure. You're the one, you're the one to talk, right? When we eat, we eat to live. We don't live just to eat. But the Bible says when it comes to spiritual food, we have to eat to live. Look at this. Jesus says this in John 6, 5, 1. He says this in John 6, 51. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. There's something fleshy about the gospel. There's something real about it. Gnosticism is this evil teaching that is it's a heresy that snuck in. You know, it, Paul talks about it, wisdom. It, 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 it's this idea that everything that is matter, everything that is flesh is evil. God created everything. And what he's doing is he's reconciling our flesh back under his dominion. All right, let me just say this. Um, when I eat these things like, you know, comfort foods in earthen pots, I'm talking about stews, cornbread. Anybody else from the South or is it just me? Yeah, all right. We're talking about smoked meats and greens. We're talking about natural foods that stick to your ribs. It calls to mind something, doesn't it? 
Memories of homecoming with friends and family. Now, this idea, soul food's been around a long time. In my first sermon last week, I talked about every culture's actually got soul food, whether it's comfort food, whether it's schnitzel or, or, or blintzes, you know, doesn't matter what, where it is. All Italian food just about is comfort food, wouldn't you say? But, but here's the deal. Around 1960s is when this phrase was coined for African Americans because of what they had to endure. Talk about heavy laden and labor. And, and, and one writer talks about coming out of the fields, she says, and, 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 and being depleted and needing this high caloric kind of thing. But that wasn't it. They also sang, didn't they? They also spoke the word. And I want to explain that, you know, this eventually spread out of just the African-American culture into the whole South. She writes how after spending long work days in the fields, we needed this kind of food. And history shows that certain techniques in Southern cuisine was shared by ancient cultures. Cultures, you can go to fried dough history if you like. Every culture's got a fried dough. Soul food, and what I'm pointing out right now is nostalgia. This word nostalgic, it comes from a, gr- t- a Greek word, two Greek words actually. It's talking about the good old days, an emotional response, a yearning, a homecoming. It's a wistful, evocative word. But let me tell you what the word means when you break it down, because I don't know if you know this, but I like words. It's this word nostalgic, nostos, return home, and algos, pain. There's a, an ache. There's a pain for home, a home. But I'm not talking about going back to Alabama. I'm talking about our heavenly home. We, we all yearn as though we're foreigners, citizens, the scripture says, of another, another. Look at this, Philippians. Here's what it says, Philippians 3.20. But our homeland is heaven. And we are waiting for our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ to come from heaven. There is an ache for home, for belonging, belonging that no boyfriend can give you, that no collard greens can really give you. Uh, But these things foreshadow that heaven is our home. And you see, we're only passing through here. Heaven is our home. The Lord himself is the bread of heaven. And so while we're here for 100 or 120 years or however long, we don't need to be, you know, holding our breath. We need to be careful, but we need to enjoy, not live with Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs. No, we need to enjoy the fat of the land. We need to, I'm talking about God's. (laughs) Because the other stuff will give you cholesterol, we know that. But the Lord's food is pure and clean. And so this nostalgia, I believe, is God-given. This ache for some place else that is home. Proverbs 10 assures us of this. The food that God gives, well, you know, I know an awesome chef who, who, she she has a, a soul food shop. You know, there's this one lady, Pauline, in Winter Garden. She's from the islands. And she makes, I mean, you guys don't get grossed out, but she makes curried oxtail. It is good. Curry goat. I like callaloo. I really like some Jamaican soul food. And it always makes me feel good, but only for an hour, right? This food is pure. Look what it says in Proverbs 22, talking about the food that only God can give. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. We have a, a little house that's an income property for us in Florida, and it, it, it brings some, uh, it helps sometimes, you know, some income. But then last month, we had to, oh my Lord, four different appliances we had to change. I mean, it was like, ah. Uh, but the blessing of the Lord, pull that up one more time. When He adds something to your life, it makes you rich without any taxes, without any sorrow. This is what the food of God will do. You can eat as much as you want and you will not get the wrong kind of fat. We all heard of good fat. That's God. In fact, the word glory, glory, doxolit, that word is weighty. Masa, it's weightiness. When God moves into the building, you can feel the weightiness of his presence. You can feel it when you spend time alone. You know, you hear them crazy charismatics. It was like a warm, which I, I kind of be one. It was like a warm blanket 
It's like a heavy blanket. Now, you may have never felt that experiential realm of the Lord, but if you seek me, he says, you will find me. If you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. Another thing about soul food is, you know, there's always another helping usually. God's like that. He, he, he never runs out. And so God's original plan for us is to live by every word that proceeds from his mouth, to cherish his word, to trust his spirit. God's diet for our lives is that we bear much fruit, even in troubled times. And so that's why it's important that we feed on God's word and that we drink his presence in every morning. They used to say this when they were trying to balance the word of God, the Bible people with the spirit people. You know, you're the, they say, too much, too much word, you dry up. And too much presence and worship, you wash away. You know, but you get it right. And so I think it's important that we understand the Holy Spirit wrote this word, but I th- and Jesus is this word, but I think it's important that we balance what it means to be in the spirit realm as we read the Bible. We eat, we drink, we eat, we drink. And so I want to point to a practical thing you can do um, after all I've just told you about. And that's what I call this. And, and I used to talk about 10 minutes, but I, I'm done with that because we do it for a couple of weeks. And so I'm just going to set the bar where it belongs. I call it your hour of power. It's your hour of power. And it's such a great habit to cultivate. And you know, you aren't your habits, but you actually become what your habits make you. If you set the right habits, you're setting the course for your life. I'm from Florida and we got, my dad has, a, I grew up a sailing. And so when you set that course and you know what your quad coordinates are, it doesn't matter what wind blows you off course, what waves hit you, you have set your course. That's what habits do for you. And they take what, 15, 22 days to, 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 to do. But once they're in your spirit, they're in your spirit. I know people that are in really good shape that crave the gym. I think they're crazy, but no, I went last week actually. But I I think that I'm not talking about just New Year's resolutions. I'm talking about getting so um, in touch with the food of God that you crave it. And the only way you can do that is to take your will. Did you know your will is a gift? He gave it to you, so you give it back to him. And you take that will and you sow it in the morning and God will give you back that time throughout the day. Here's what he says, I prepare a table for you. You and the king of the universe, you, I mean, we all go around looking for squirrels, looking for nuts every day. We're looking for a nut, whether it's money, love, touch me, hold me, tell me I'm great, look what I did. Whatever that nut you think you're chasing is, this is the king of nuts. (laughs) He's the king of the universe. He's got all the nuts, and he's saying, I've prepared a table for you. Bob, um... Chatham is his name, and he's from Church in the Sun, great man. He was one of my first life group leaders. And Bob said every morning, I think I've told you this before, but he gets up real early, and he had a pretty, I think he had to be at work at 7 or 7.30, so he was up pretty early, and he would set, he had a little screened-in pool, and he had a little table out there in Florida you can eat outside all year long, and he would always pour two glasses of orange juice, one for him and one for the Lord. And Bob was a little charismatic. I'm like, did, he, did the Lord ever drink that? He said, no. No, he'd have to pour it back every morning, but it didn't matter because he needed that visual, that rudimentary visual, you know, to really, Mac McCambridge, another one of my mentors, you know what he used to tell me, Deb? I'd wake up, I'd say, well, I prayed. He goes, did you write it down? I'm like, what? That's just so rudimentary. I don't have to do that. Write your stuff down and put it in the basket. And you're like, well, I don't know how that works. Well, it's the same way I can stare at a dumbbell and do reps in my mind, but until I get it into my physiology, there's things you have to do. He prepares for you a table with the king of the universe. That is the breakfast of champions. And so, look, I know this is very basic, but listen, pick a spot by your fireplace. Maybe you light a candle next to your favorite chair, but make it, make it, see, what I'm trying to get across is not the dry cornmeal I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the good stuff. Make it comforting to your soul, your fireplace, a soft chair. Let your body be addicted to this rest too. 
He says it'll be healing to your bones. And then pull out, I was gonna prepare a, a whole list for it. Look, it's called Psalms. That's the, that's the easiest cookbook you can find because there is, for every problem you face, for every challenge you're dealing with, for everywhere you grieve, there is a corresponding note in one of the Psalms. Did you know that? And you just open up that book. You sit in that chair. You light a candle. I know, I know this touchy-feely, guys. You get a warm blanket and you sit there in the stillness of the morning with the king. Now, I know it may have been a while and so you may need to get out your holy machete and cut the vines off your Bible. But I'm telling you that it will change your life to spend time with him. And when you're done reading a little, just sit. What does he say? Be still and know that I am God. Heard of an old preacher who had a great church family. They had him over every year. They said, Pastor, we want you to come over Christmas every year for dinner. And they'd always bless him when he came over. And one day, um, they, he had left. They had a great dinner, and she was cleaning up the wife, and she's a very hospitable woman. And I think I've told you this before, but she noticed that, you know, they put out the best china for the pastor. Her silver spoon was missing. She said, I think he took it. It's retirement plan or something. He took one of my silver spoons. And she was just mad, but she didn't have the audacity to ask him. So the next year, he comes the same time around holidays. They're eating. She just, you know, she just can't stand it. And she just says, Pastor, I'm sorry, but did you, I, I don't mean to be, did you take my spoon last year? And he says, your spoon? Yeah, my teaspoon, my little silver. Oh, no, sweetie, I put that in your Bible. We need to read that thing. We need to get those sweet morsels into our spirit because he's the king and he serves the very best food. Did you know that Jesus Christ, the son of God, would depart sometimes from people to be alone, to pray and to worship and to spend time with God? I, I don't know how smart I... Bend your mind. God had to spend time with God. Jesus had to get away and spend time with his father. If he had to do that, how much more do we? And, and, I, and I think I, I didn't ever understood the math of that until I realized that God is three in one. And the whole essence of Jesus, the father and the spirit is unity, fellowship, communion, and love. That's what we've entered into when we said yes. There is, there's nothing more refreshing than intimacy. You're all, you're all adults in here. Intimacy can be fun. It also produces babies in its extreme sense. But I want to explain to you something. Sorry, is that a little yada, yada, yada? <laughs> yada, yada, yada. You know what the word for closeness is in the Bible? Yada. It says, Adam yadad his wife. But that's the same word when God says, you will know me. Do you understand in God's economy, sex is like a rudimentary way of connecting. There's something so much deeper. In fact, he comes to live inside of us. Think about that. And so I said this last week, but we run around like ravenous wolves. Scratch my itch, fill my cup. And he says, I have prepared a table before you in the presence of these jokers, and I will anoint your head with oil and your cup will runneth over. He'll fill your cup. And then it's all gravy from there. You can actually love your wife because you're already full. You're not coming to her. <laughs> and so all I'm trying to get you to do is to commit. Commit to spend a little time with him. <laughs> commit to spend a little time with him. And, and let me tell you the difference with commitment. Commitment precedes every, everything. Everything resolve will bring about all the resources that you want. And there's a, a, a very wide gap between the kind of people that say, I will, and the kind of people that say, I wish, say, I will commit to spend time with the Lord this year. And when I fall off the wagon and I don't do it for a day or two or three or four or five or six or seven, seven days without the word of God makes one week. If that happens to you, Get right back on the horse. Get right back in your chair and sit there. But I don't feel anything. I understand. Show up the next day. 
Give the Lord three days and I guarantee you, you'll feel something. You'll know that you are not alone. And that's what he says. You are not alone. So all I'm saying is please commit to an hour of power with God. And start with Psalm 23 and keep on reading. There's even a whole list called the Song of Ascents going up. So if you feel like kicking rocks, read the Song of Ascents. It has to do with going up to Israel, but it's still an important lift to your spirit. I overheard a psychologist on the news commenting on the crisis we've been through in the last 24 months. And he said, to be brutally honest, we just do not know what each of us have, has endured on an emotional level. You know what I'm talking about. You got Netflix. You're watching some, your wife's watching some Hallmark movie. And it's like, look at this, is like a soap, what is this? And you just take a second, and then you're like, right? And you're just crying, you're like, why am I crying? There's layers, people. There's layers. When we were in the old church, we'd have this thing called an encounter, right, David? And we would always describe it like, hi, welcome. It was usually, and we'd always break up the men and the women, right? I'm keeping an eye on the time here. We'd break up the men and the women and we would say men's encounter. And men's encounters are like, oh, blah, blah, blah. I'm here to meet the Lord again, go a little deeper with the Lord. Where's the coffee? You know what I'm saying? But by the first night, David, on their faces crying, all of us, even the pastors, because there's something about when brothers get together to seek the Lord. But we would always describe it as an onion, our walk with the Lord. It, there's layers to it. And you're fine, but, and I'm not saying go digging too deep. The Lord will bring up what he needs to bring up. But if you sit before the Lord, you will behold, what you behold, you will become. What you behold, you will become. I don't want to make light of Columbine and all the awful shootings that we had, but Mac McCambridge, I've mentioned him twice in this sermon, was my first father in the Lord, my first mentor. And he said to me, he was a New Yorker, and he's like, guy, these shootings, they're awful. I said, I know, Mac. He says, but you told them, like I'm, like I'm responsible, but that's the way New Yorkers talk. You told them they came from monkeys. You told them they act, they're apes, and then when they act like beasts, you're surprised. Mac saw everything very simply. But he said, what we behold, we become. All the violence. So, so here's the thing. You want to think the thoughts of God, you want to have peace that passes all understanding, you have to behold as in a mirror the image, your true image, because you are made in God's image. Yeah, but I want to be made in Beyonce's image. Okay, then you go through your undulations because I'm made in God's image and Vin Diesel's. But what I'm saying is this. I overheard him talking about this, and he said the product of all this deferred anxiety is a weightiness on our souls. And so I'm not asking you to go to an encounter. I will in a couple months. But right now I'm just saying spend time just in little blocks. Then it won't be so painful. And let some of that, those skins come off of you so that you can begin to live a victorious life because I don't know that things are gonna gonna get easier. I I talked about snowshoes. We're trekking through some. It may get deeper, but snowshoes, they they keep you above the surface. And so look at this, Psalm Isaiah 59, Isaiah 59, 19, as I begin to turn the corner to closing this talk today. It says this, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. When the enemy floods you, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Now take that down and we'll put it right back. Okay, Tom. I always talk about how the word of God is a double-edged sword. You know, the scripture says that it's a two-edged sword. It cuts, it heals. Let me show you a perfect example of that. It says this, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. See that comma? That's not in the, there's no comma in the, in the original um, Hebrew, in, in the Aramaic. The Bible says you have to rightly divide the word. It's not wrong. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. But you know what? I was sitting in the presence of the Lord meditating on this scripture. And in my book, it doesn't have a comma. And so I, was, I realized I can rightly divide the word by the power of the Holy Spirit. When the enemy shall come in 
like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Which one's right? Yes. What a difference, though. God says, hey, I told you before, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord lifts. But guess what else, son? When he comes in like a flood, I shall lift up a standard. There is so much wealth in the word. When you sit in the presence, what you, what, what, what you thought it meant when it was cutting you one day might mean something different on Tuesday when it's healing you. So God's not saying anything new. He's just saying something present for you. Anyone know the word rhema? Gosh, I'm teaching a lot. Your eyes are getting glazed over. The word rhema means any freshly spoken word of God. And in that is this, this word that's been sitting there for 4,000 years, all of a sudden has come alive in your spirit. That's why you have to sit in his presence. Okay, I, I've said this before and, and I've said it 12 times now. Resolve to come to his banquet. God promises us all through his love letter. You know, the Lord's table is, is all through this book. It's like a red thread. The Lord's table, the Lord's table, the Lord's table. But look what he says about the banqueting hall. In the Song of Solomon, which is the, the bride's song, this us, we're the bride. He says, let him lead me to the banquet hall and let his banner over me be love. So what is your job? Let me, this is a in your face sermon. What is your job? Here's your job. I'm probably gonna go off camera, but here's your job. I'm gonna go to the couch. Here's your job. You wake up in the morning. Let's skip the bathroom part. But anyway, you wake up. All you got to do is get to that spot and sit and open and just through crusty eyes. Let me do it again, David. It's going to follow me now. Get to that spot. Be still and know that I am God. Can you do that? Because I felt it was important enough to show you how it works. But it's the, it is the simplest thing to do, but it is one of the hardest things even for pastors to do. In this passage, the bride is saying, lead me to the banqueting table because he wants you to eat the kingly stuff. I love this. My food, Jesus said in John 4, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. How can you have the food of the Lord? Because the food of the Lord is, is to do his will as well. Unless he tells you what to do that day, spiritually, you, I mean, I know you got a list, but he's gonna give you a how. He's gonna give you a word. And when you do his will, you end up being satisfied because that's what the Father wants you to do. I've actually covered two points. Here's the third. Doing what God wants you to do, the third and last point. Doing what God wants you to do, do will provide satisfaction and fulfillment in your life. God wants you to sit alone with him, take some time, read his word, devour the soul food that's in there, and then have the satisfaction, have the satisfaction of seeing his will come to pass. And I want you to remember that it's hard because it's, there's no orange juice, there's no eggs and bacon, it's just you and this book and his spirit. But it is the best food. It is the king's food. And it's worth it. Maybe you're looking um, so hard for a way out of this thing when we need to sit in this thing and we need to let him show us a way through with him. As I close, um, the Lord is serving up peace. And here's what he says in Isaiah 55. Seek him, seek Yehovah, while he may be found. That word seek in the Greek is darash, and it means this, experiential knowledge. You can actually experience God. You can get acquainted with God. David, you can play now. As David comes, I, I know it's time to go. I, I want you to commit with me. If any of you are ready to say, I will. I want to be closer to the Lord. Just raise your hand as I pray. I want to know him. I want what, I mean, pastor, I know the words are on the book, but I want experiential knowledge. I don't, I don't need to feel a warm blanket every day or, 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 or goosebumps, but 
is there, there's a sixth sense in me, there's an angst in me that I, I need to fill and I wanna know his peace. I'm gonna pray for that right now. Those of you that raised your hand and even those of you that are just thinking about it. God, Papa, I sit at your table. Would you pass the potatoes to Ben? Would you pass the roast beef to Ken when he sits in your presence? Would you, would you pass the sweets down? Papa, would you do that so that they can taste the goodness? Your word says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Daddy, I know your desire is to fellowship with us all. And if we just show up, you will lead us into your banqueting table. Father, I pray that we would get real with you deep inside as we're aching for a home we've never really found, as we're hungry for something this world can never supply. I pray that you would do what you said in John 14. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father and I will come and we will dine and make our home with him. Right now, we're going to pass out. I pray these things in Jesus' name that every one of you would, would know the Lord in a greater way this year. That no matter what waves try to capsize your boat, He would balance you like a keel holding you still and steady among every storm, amongst every storm. Right now, Greg and the team are going to pass out um, communion. We're going to eat it together, and then we're going to go in peace as we walk out into a brand new year. Thanks for coming this first Sunday and braving the snow. As he does that, as Greg passes out this um, communion wafers, I, I want to tell you this. It says this, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, is this not participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we eat taking part of the body of Christ? Yeah, it is. When we do this, friends, thank you, we take part of the body and blood of Jesus. Did you know that Christ was sitting, well, I guess he was standing, I don't know, but he was in a group of people like this, and he said, Beverly, if you don't eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part in me. Now, he didn't call out Beverly's name. He said that to all of them. But I wanted to get her attention because I saw the light of the Lord on her. But imagine that. If you don't eat me and drink my blood, you have no part in me. So I don't think I'm barking up the wrong tree today, friends. And you know what the Bible says? Most of them left. Now, you can metaphorize that, metaphor, I kick, kick, kick that as much as you want. And, and there are many layers to that. I don't think he wanted him to come up and take a chunk out of his arm, okay? But if we don't chew on the reality of Christ in our lives, we have no part of him. And so right now, open up this dry wafer that human hands have made. And let's just trust, not in the, in the wafer, not in the accidentals, but in the spirit behind it, the bread of heaven that Christ is. Lord, we're not worthy to receive you, but only say your word and we will be made whole. The body of Christ.
took the cup again he gave thanks and praise and he said this is my blood the everlasting covenant the new he said an everlasting covenant do this in memory of me and so we receive the blood of Christ as I close church I know I said that four times the Bible says that the sluggard sits before the bowl, but he doesn't have the energy to even reach out and take the food. As I watched you all, you used your will, you used your energy, you used your physiology to take a sip. I'm driving this home, but I want you to do this. I want you to use your will this week to sit in his presence and to really ask him to become your spiritual food. And I'll be praying that God will speak to your hearts and touch you in a new way. I love you, church. Have a beautiful, beautiful week. The Mass has ended. Go forth in peace. I love you all. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning in today. If you were blessed by this message at all, then be a blessing and give to the work of the Lord at eldoradochurch.org.